And what is up? Hold out your glass, because we're about to fill it up. Welcome to the Prometheus Lens Podcast, the place where the conversations are always enlightening. I'm your host, Justin, and here we like to use the allegory of the Prometheus Lens to take a second look at everything. Well, today, got a... Get talking about the, a book he's working on. Fascinating subject for about the past, you know, two years. But this this guy's no uh, new newcomer to the podcasting and content creation game. He's been in it since around 2014, 2015. But uh, I've seen him talk on several shows and uh, reached out to him and asked if he'd come on and uh, talk about his upcoming book that he's been working on. So this is a, an episode if you're into to giants. that he believes clowns are mirrored images and imitations of the Nephilim. So I'd like to uh, welcome to the show Paul Stobbs from Understanding Conspiracy. So Paul, thank you for coming on today. No problem. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So the Nephilim and clowns, uh, just... Uh, Mere saying that is kind of a, a, a shock factor, and a slap to the head of your, of your paradigm. Yeah. Uh, how did you stumble upon this? <laughs> you know what? It's, 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 a, it's a silly, stupid story that goes on for, for longer than I would like it to go on every time I try and tell this story. Um, it's I, I, the short version is um, things that weren't clear when I was lost and were hazy, kind of became very clear once I was saved. So this is a strictly biblical theory, and it came from being quite versed in biblical history, think these concepts. And just when I first came to Christ, I came from the New Age, psychedelic, tripping culture, you know, and I was um, kind of seeped in occult knowledge and things like this because I was looking for answers to spiritualism and was avoiding the Christian angle for so long. But after some personal experiences and some spiritual attacks, you know, my, my faith in Christ was pretty well solidified by uh, 2014, um, not long after I started the channel. And I, I just went on a journey to try and find out as much as I can about biblical history and um, where demons come from, because this was personal to me. Um, and then I led on to the Book of Enoch. A lot of uh, work by Gary Wayne was a huge inspiration. I, th I think he's nailed it. And... Um, as somebody who wasn't raised in a church, I found a lot of his answers kind of explained to me a lot about the Bible that I wasn't so sure about, you know, that he gave a lot of context for what was really going in this antediluvian age because floods and, and uh, you know, the wiping out of a lot of people and the uh, corruption of flesh and all these odd concepts, you know, kind of all made sense once I understood the existence of the Nephilim and the Watchers and the uh, the mating of angels with human women, you know. Um and I'm, I'm an artist by nature, I, 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 by degree as well. You know, I got my degree in fine art around the same year after I graduated in 2014. And I've always just been a guy who sees patterns, pattern recognition, and I've always liked to visualize things when I'm thinking about them. So I've always had this curiosity of, well, what, what would the Nephilim have looked like? That's always been there for me. And I was never really happy or satisfied with most of the artistic renditions I saw during that era of conspiracy a decade ago. Because um, this topic was relatively new then, there was a, a big subculture online at that time talking about the Nephilim, and you know, people like Rob Skiba who were talking about it as well and trying to explain, you know, how did they survive after the flood and inserting his theories and ideas into it. Um, I always watched these presentations and saw these images of like really tanned, huge pectoral muscled men, you know, wearing loincloths with like braided brown hair and with like just like tanned, and I was like, that looks very human. I don't think they would have looked like that if their fathers were angelic. That never, it never sat with me very well, you know, and I always kind of wondered, well, what would they have actually looked like? And um, so as I give a brief discussion there, you know, my background, I was, I, I was heavily seeked before I was saved in trying to find some kind of spiritual answers by exploring psychedelic realms. And I was uh, studying things like Eastern philosophies and, and Taoism and all that sort of stuff, trying to, trying to understand consciousness and self and what it means for there to be a god and all that kind of stuff you know and and to get answers fast i i went down the hardcore 
DMT, acid, mushroom type route. I wanted to see these other dimensions and get to grips with what they actually were. And I wanted to communicate with anything that was on the other side, if possible. But for me personally, and I never actually encountered any entities when I did all these things for a good solid four years of my life, you know, quite consistently. And I'm not saying I'm disappointed in hindsight. Maybe I was being protected now I think about it. But uh, once I left that life behind and after exploring these realms and it solidifying for me, the spiritual realm is real. This is a real place separate from me. And then understanding the biblical perspective to answer all these conspiracy questions I was researching at the same time as well while starting this channel called Understanding Conspiracy, I I realized God's real too. And this is his creation. And I'm I'm basically just peeking into the, the workings of how his creation works, you know, how it's, it was proved enough for me through my own experiences that that was real. So I, I tried to get to know God in a real sense. And I dropped all this ideology of, well, I'm a God. You know, I'm I'm just projecting this reality, and and everything's just a, an ethereal hallu a hallucination of consciousness, and it's just and we're all just God pretending to forget that word God, so we can experience life. All these type of ideas, I just drop them. I thought, no, there's a real creator separate from me, and I need to get to know him. And uh, from that day, you know, I gave myself over to Christ, and in 2014, in March, and that's when I actually started to see, see entities, not when I was on these psychedelic drugs that's when they came for me and they were not pleasant they were not my friends they i was an enemy to these things that's the only way i can describe it i was having constant paralysis sleep paralysis strangulation in sleep monsters just just coming at me shadow people hat men entities in dreams chasing me telling me they're going to kill me um i had moments in waking life where i just passed out and collapsed paralyzed and then i thought my darkness started to seep in from the edges of my visions and i was spiraling into some weird vortex and then i had to call on jesus to help me and i was back in the room and all these things just kept happening after i stopped exploring these realms and then it, it culminated in a vision for 10 seconds out of nowhere for no reason whatsoever again and I recognized where I was instantly. I'm back in the DMT realm, which I was very well familiar with. And I was looking up at an enormous black and white lined, big, wide, purple, green, purple glowing guy, Jester. And I, I couldn't explain it as anything else. It wasn't wearing Jester's clothes. It wasn't like had bells on it or anything. It was shaped and colored. Its skin was like this, you know, and its big, wide mouth wasn't makeup. It could open its mouth like that. It was just like a horrific monster more than anything. And I was looking at this Was it thing. skiing, shimmering? Yeah, yeah. It, it was radiating energy and ethereal. And it was black and white, shimmering, pearlescent, multicolored. It was enormous. I'm talking like a sky... I'm looking up at a skyscraper here, you know, of this, this beast in front was of me. Was it a mechanical world? Kind of, yeah. It was the whole machine L thing, Terence McKenna's yes. machinations. It, you can try and describe this with language... It falls short every time. Um, but this jester was a part of the background and the realm at the same time as being a, a kind of a, a form too. It, it, it's a very trippy place to see it. It's like, yeah. it's like it was a sculpture coming out of a arabesque wall, but it was, it was conscious. It was alive. It, it could move. It could look down at me. It saw me. It knew I was there looking at it, you know. It was the, it was the megapixels that was made up. Of this, this realm <laughs> something like that yeah i mean again I, I i cannot physically describe the detail i can give you i can tell you right now it looked like a giant jester clown in front of me and just looking up at this thing for 10 seconds and i, I knew again because you have this weird familiar f have you had a dream where you remembered the dream you've already had it's like i've been here but i've already dreamt this before it's like a familiar dream that's what it felt like and it's like i've been to this place before the dmt realm i know i'm back in this same dimension i used to explore but this time this thing's here and i never You're saw anything enemy this time well yeah exactly and now it's looking at me you know and and it was so large that it kind of had creatures flying around it that looks small in comparison, but if it was to be put next to me, it'd be like a car next to me. You know, these things that are flying around it. They were, they were, it was just terrifying. And then I'm back, I'm back, I'm just back all of a sudden. And people call these things DMT flashbacks. This is a real phenomenon that people who do these drugs end up having for temporarily, um, you know, it's kind of has to stop it and it fizzles out and disappears. And, you know, I, I've been sober since that day. I, I don't smoke cannabis anymore, which I smoked for eight years every day. I haven't touched a psychedelic since. I don't even drink, you know, and I've quit nicotine as well. And I'm, I'm just I'm just done with anything like that. And, cause, and I realized in hindsight, it's kind of now I've come to Jesus. I think these 
demons, which is what we'll get onto and what they are, saw no use for me anymore. I'm now useless to them. And I think it's more of a, if we can't have you, nobody can situation, which is why I think they came for me immediately after I was saved. It's kind of, let's get him before he realizes what he can do to stop us, you know, and um, luckily calling on Jesus saved me from that death experience. And as I've got stronger in the faith, these things have stopped and gone now and left me alone. It doesn't seem to be an issue anymore, but that initial leaving behind that life did give me these experiences, which set me up for what's to come with this research, really, because I'd seen some things. I just since I can't really die. I've seen some stuff, you know, what can what am I supposed to do now, you know, with this information? I didn't know what to make of it then. I knew people saw DMT just as on DMT prior to this because I'd seen all the literature, I'd read all the books, I'd followed all the gurus, I'd been on the forums, the next DMT Nexus. I knew this was a phenomena. And here I am finally, I've seen one of these things for myself, and I'm like, these people aren't joking. I'm like, this is real. Like this is these things are actually there, you know. So, you know, I <laughs> I had enough knowledge by this point from my research into the Christian biblical narrative about the Nephilim to understand that the disembodied spirits are of the Nephilim, as it explains in the Book of Enoch. You know, once once they died, that because they are of the earth, the souls are stuck on earth in a way. Their spirits, their nefeshes, whatever you want to describe it, and they have nowhere to go. They don't leave the place when they die. They just become disembodied, but they're kind of still here, just in this other hidden veil world which is our world it's, and I, I describe this place as the plumbing of the universe they're like stuck behind the walls of our reality you know they're in the pipes they're in the wiring of a machine you know they are the ghost in the machine in, in a sense and they're in a place where uh, things aren't embodied and we're in a place where things are embodied we have a, a body in which we can be housed in a way, but the body and soul are, are the same thing, that they're, they're interconnected and we we do live a spiritual existence. And this is just as much of a spiritual realm as that realm they're in. We've only made the distinction in our own dualistic way, I've realized. But <laughs> it's it's all very trippy and psychedelic to think about, you know. But what I'm saying is where they are is not great. It's not some hyper dimensional, fifth dimensional better place, which most people seem to consider when they do these drugs, like I'm going to a better place. They're in, they're in like a really terrible place, which I would not like to stay there much longer than five minutes. You would go insane. It's too much. It's too, too much chaos, you know, and I think that's where the demonic possession phenomena comes from. They are desperate to get back into a body just for, just to rest. They need to rest. It's too much there. They, you know, not having a body and being surrounded by millions of your buddies, you know, who also are stuck there as well, kind of melding Just into each other. Just as miserable as you are. It's cre creating like some kind of weird <laughs> hive mind, Borg consciousness, all blended together type thing where they have no sense of self or personality. And I think they're just desperate to get into a body so they can just sense what it's like to have fingers again or have eyes or a nose or a mouth or anything. And then usually because these things are pretty corrupt, they start using the vessel they've, got a hold of to do stuff that it wants to feel and taste and see and smell you know and that's what demonic possession really is it's the subtle influence of these entities to make you do things which it wants the pleasure from and it'll do that through your senses you know and it's kind of like a, a, mm. a parasite in a way and yeah. i knew i kind of again all this stuff i'm saying i'm saying because it's kind of I already had all this foundational knowledge and this understanding that, that there's a biblical history that explains why these things are here. And now I've seen one for myself. I had no shadow of a doubt that the, well, the disembodied spirits which are there are of the Nephilim. They look like jesters in this spirit realm. That is what they look like. I've, I've seen them, you know, this is not, and these are not collective archetypes of the Jungian consciousness that people want to talk about, you know, the collective consciousness arc, typical symbols that reflect mankind's thoughts and feelings about certain situations. These are right, these are like separate entities from us with real consciousness and their own identities and feelings and thoughts and agendas that are just stuck in this place. And our ignorance of it makes us think that they're they're us in some way or something or they, they always tell a different story to whoever comes along. Oh, yeah, well, well we're like fifth dimensional ascended masters who have come to teach you enlightenment. Or were you from the future? Were humanity's future, you know, and you just have yet to reach our level of consciousness or something? Or were aliens from an interdimensional galactic federate? They have a different story to whoever comes mm -hmm. to them because they or know your how dead uncle come back to give you a message. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, they can play, they can play us, you know, and they, they know what you want to hear. And that, that's kind of their game, you know, but they can't 
can't hide the way they look, and they always seem to have this psychedelic, fractaled, patterned nature to them, a lot like a jester costume. And they have these unmistakable wide smiles and huge eyes, you know. So anyway, anyway, I, I started to look into kind of biblical history and, and ideas of the Nephilim and what they look like and artistic renditions. And it's hard to know what you're looking for because all we really have are like depictions of giant people from like the Middle East, the Mesopotamian myths and Enkidu and all these type of things. And they look, they do, they look kind of human, you know. We have the skulls, the elongated skulls, and we can infer what that would look like with skin. But it's just a guess. You know, exactly, one right next to you there. I want to get one of them for myself, actually, for my own studio I'm going to be making. But uh, you can only infer what they're going to look like. Etsy, there you go. But the problem is, have you ever seen these um, scientific renditions of what, like, they would think a cat looks like based on its skeleton? And it's like this monstrous, thin, horrible-looking thing. But when you see it in reality, it's this fluffy, cute thing, you know. I don't think we can really interpret what that skull behind you with skin would actually look like. I don't think we fully understand even what the nature of its skin would be if it's part reptilian. It's not like us. They don't look human when they ha- when you put skin on that skeleton, you know. It's like have you have you seen like the animal like a hippo for example? A skeleton of a hippo, it's monstrous and you would think it was some vicious sharp toothed thin muscly beast but you look at them it's this plump round silly looking thing you know <laughs> and i think that's what we have to apply to these skeletons we found of these giants you know which most of them went missing in the 1800s when the smithsonian rolled in but from what we can infer from the descriptions in the newspaper clippings from those eras they were they were not human looking they were weird these giant skeletons were very strange even josephus Flavius Josephus, one of the first century Jewish historians, he's describing in his thing, like, just down the road, you can go see one of these skeleton bones of these giants. You can go see them on display. And it says the countenance is unlike anything we've ever seen. It's He's saying these are not humans. These do not look like human skeletons. Like, they look nuts. Like, there's something weird about them. But all the artistic renditions I ever saw, which are made by artists in the modern day, trying to imagine giants, it's just human looking things. And Again, this can this way connect all this stuff was firing off at once and then twenty sixteen came along and we had the creepy clown sightings, didn't we, where people were making people jump or scaring them by standing men- menacingly on the edges of forests with a clown costume on holding a balloon or something or on the side of like freeways or in front of schools in some cases and it became the creepy clown sighting phenomenon of twenty sixteen. Every news station was talking about this and something clicked then. And I was like, I know enough about the occult and about secret societies to know that nothing gets on that box in the corner of my living room unless they want it to be there. Everything's a symbol. Everything's a message, especially if all the news is picking up on it from every station everywhere across countries, England, Europe and America, you know, especially the Western world. Why? Why are they showing this? And I knew the clown is a symbol for something. The clown means something to these people. They wouldn't be saying creepy clown sightings. People are sighting clowns, mysterious figures of clowns everywhere, unless that meant something to them. And it all kind of just amalgamated in my mind at that moment. I was like, okay, so we have Nephilim disembodied spirits, which are the demons today, which look like clowns and jesters in the spirit realm. And now they're talking about clowns on TV returning and people are going to start seeing them and it's going to get weird and trippy, you know? So I just did a search, Nephilim and Clown, and I found nothing. No one has ever done any research to put these two things together in any serious capacity. Credit where credit's due. There was one guy called The Epic Conspiracy on YouTube. Um, I think he had like 200 subscribers and had made some parody videos uh, making fun of conspiracy theorists. And he did it in the typical History Channel style, you know. And he did one on the Nephilim. And he, he described what the Nephilim looked like. Um, And he says, you know, the Nephilim have white skin and red hair and, I don't know, giant mouths and all these type of things and uh, two sets of teeth. And there's only one explanation. These things are interdimensional killer clowns from out of space. And then he showed the 80s movie image next to it, you know, and making a joke about the, the Nephilim. And I realized yeah, actually, what's crazy is in that movie they wrapped them up in cotton candy and ate them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and they were often depicted in the shadows as uh, lizards, giant lizards. At one point, the shadow turned into a T Rex and ate somebody at a bus stop, I believe. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of this whole reptilian hybrid mixed with clown. It's all it's been there forever, and we'll get into that later about the media, you know. But they've been showing this for a long time. It's one of those symbols where once you see it, 
you can't unsee it. It's like it's hidden in plain sight and always has been hidden in plain sight. It's one, it's one of those symbols. So that was it. You know, from that moment when that guy made that joke, I was like, I rolled with it. I was like, you know, th there was more to this than this guy lets on. He doesn't even believe the Nephilim exists. So let's forget about that. You know, he's just he's just having a joke. But uh, I knew there was something here. So I went I went with it. And one connection after another, six years, eight years later now, I've got, I'm about to release the 44th episode of a series dedicated to this. I'm about to publish my first book on the subject, volume one, which lays out all the history of where we get a clown from. Um, but it's, it's, it's come to fruition and it's obvious now that what we call a clown was a purposefully crafted Western symbol modeled after Eastern demons. And that's exactly the Rakshishas specifically. But it also has its roots, early roots, in uh, medieval wild man tradition as well, which is the European's flavour of giants, uh, hairy wild beast men, and the Nephilim as well, which were actually a lot more colourful than we think when we actually start looking into it. They weren't just like have like big brown or green hair or anything. They were actually quite psychedelic, hairy looking beasts, you know, um, possibly feathered as well in some cases. It gets really weird. But uh, yeah, what we call a clown is was purposefully created by Freemasonry to represent demons and it's done for a specific reason it's actually a tool that is used for the specific purpose of channeling the nephilim from the spirit realm and this is a practice done by hundreds of cultures all over the earth on every continent they dress like things to channel the things or to be possessed by the things and in some slightly rarer cases to scare away things, though I don't think there's much validity to that train of thought personally from my research. I think they're a bit naive if they think dressing like a demon is going to scare away a demon. But everywhere else, the practice is quite straightforward. We white up our face and put red lipstick on and multicolored patterns, skin and dots and fractal patterns and put a shiny costume on with a wild feathery red headdress because we want to channel our ancestors. And they believe the Nephilim to be the creators of their civilizations. That's what they mean by ancestor. They don't mean aunties or uncles. They mean ancient gods. And that's what they're doing. They're dressing like clowns to channel the Nephilim spirits. And what we have done in the West is create our own version of this costume. And we call it a clown. And it's hidden from us, but it's used for the same purpose. And quite nefariously, it seems like it's been pushed on us and our society to open up more channels to the spirit realm by popularizing the clown in modern mainstream media, which again, we're all conspiracy theorists here, is fully controlled by the occultists and the, and the secret societies for this very reason. So that's it. That's all of it in a nutshell, where it came from, where the work led to. So we can get into some details now. But there we go. Yeah, well, as far as like the uh, the details of the you know of the costume, you know the the red nose and the uh, the color of the skin and uh, the big feet, uh, just all these different characteristics. Do during your research have you found this like as a uh, a progression through history and with different cultures and and the practice like of it coming through. And uh, if if you have like, could you give some like examples and kind of kind of build this costume up piece by piece and show us you know where it come from where where have you seen it in other cultures and the common themes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the the base of a costume of a clown is white skin, okay, and that's that's white chalk makeup is what clowns tend to put on grease paint of some kind. Um, you can get into the late, really later iterations of 20, 20th century clowns where you get like um, uh, peach-coloured or hobo face paint, but they're kind of like character clowns based off the, the original clowns, which is white grease paint or Pedrolino from the Camille de l'Arts or Puero from the French tradition. It's basically just like a white ghost wearing a white costume. Um, but that, that is the base of a clown. And that is actually rooted in just a direct mirror of, of descriptions of Nephilim themselves. Um, in, every, in every culture, wherever giants have been present, they're always described as having really, really pale skin for some reason. And the most famous examples are like the city car of the northern plains of America, for example. The mound builders, these giant, pale-skinned, red-haired, cannibalistic tribes that went around um, brutalizing a lot of these tribes of, North, of the North American plains. And the war was made with them. And the story goes that they were trapped into Lovelock Cave, the giants, and the Indians 
clogged up the entrance of the cave with very flammable things and just set fire to it and basically smoked them out and they died in that cave. And there was later evidence from archaeological digs to prove that there were plenty of things that were living in here and skeletons were found and all sorts of stuff that seems to corroborate the story is true. Um, so there's this other tradition as well. There's, there's, a, there's a woman who from these tribes who still travels today and i've got her in my book my, my name is eluding me right now but the, the, she she you can find out about it it's called a morning dress um and they have these these things they pass down in the family's tradition and she still has hers today and she goes around showing it people but it's basically made of red hair which they got from scalping these giants basically and they t turn it into like a shoal of some kind and they call it a morning dress and it's kind of like passed down as a symbol through the family of of defeating the giants you know but again the, the common descriptor is white skin and red hair that is the base of a clown and that's why our modern clown has the same thing but that, it doesn't just end there if you go for example all the way to australia and then you go to the middle western area of australia called the kimberley region so we're talking right in the outback here you know in the middle of the desert basically you get these people um who have a very specific god called a wand gina now a wand gina is supposed to be the bringers of rain and thunder they're weather gods of some kind so they have powers that control the weather first of all but they were also very tangible physical walking on two leg giants as well they were the one in the same they say they say they're both ethereal and physical simultaneously so they had human physical properties and mystical magical angelic properties basically in in one form and um, it's it's said that they helped teach mankind how to build society basically they were heavily involved in culture building you know and these people equate them to being the builders of their ancient civilization so the ancestors once again the same story you'll find gets applied quite a lot of places but in this one isolated region of australia and australia is huge by the way it's enormous you know so this there's a lot of tribes here and this is i'm just focusing on one and they they quite literally paint the wangina on the rocks to look like clowns and i'm talking very literally here they have white skin big black eyes and no mouth funnily enough but i've seen depictions where they have a red nose a round red circle for a nose and a big red halo which looks like a red clown wig and then the costume this thing's wearing quite literally has a white ruff around the neck like modern clowns today in the west the exact same shape and its costume is red with white polka dots like a clown costume so you can see the direct influence our clown costumes in the West today had got from this very specific isolated tribe, which was representing the offspring of the rainbow serpents. Okay, so these are hybrid rainbow serpent creatures, which have some kind of human property to them, which were giants. There's many depictions of them holding tiny people, okay? And they built the ancient civilizations these people venerated and when they died it said they drew a self-portrait on the inside of a cave and now the, sh the shamans of the area today repaint them every year and only they're allowed to do it to keep it true to its original form and they look very much like a western clown it's actually stupid how much they look like a clown so you clearly whoever created the clown this model image of we call the clown had seen this they must have seen these things and brought it back to the west and incorporated it as a viable costume for their version of the same spirit of the of the same thing you know so that's there you go so there's there's two examples you've got the city car white skin red hair you've got this pale skin thing over here but if you go to the let's say greece in greece they have their own mythos of pantheons of angelic gods um you know mating with human women it's quite common actually <laughs> i think zeus is said to have like 53 children with human women or something like that creating these demigod hybrid half god half human hybrids of some kind uh taking shape shifting and changing form becoming animals to rape women uh, or becoming like the king of a queen and um, while the king's away and sleeping with the queen for a weekend before the king comes back things like this were always happening but then it seems things got really weird and monsters were being created at the same time. And it seems like one particular sea god called Typhon had sex with a siren called Echidna. Okay, so he was like a primordial sea god, serpentine sea god. So this is a, this is a, a sea dragon 
by any stretch of the imagination. This is an angel. This is a seraphim angel, a fiery flying serpent, but of the sea. And dragon, sea dragons are very common even in Chinese mythos. You know, there's even a story in China where the sea dragons rebelled against the Jade Emperor to bring rain for the people. So the rain bringers again. You see these common themes everywhere. Anyway, yeah, back to... different telling of Prometheus, bringing the fire. Bringing the fire from the gods, giving it to the humans. Yeah, that's a, a typical Luciferian doctrine as well. It's, it's all there. But you've got this... If you zoom in on this particular one, you've got this sea god serpent monster, which is, I'll, I will call it a seraphim angel. That's what it was, just by a different name. It was called Typhon. And it, and it says it slept with Echidna, who was called the mother of monsters. Now, we have to go back to the Book of Enoch now, which gives an explanation for what this is. It says that the women who originally mated with the Watchers, and who the Watchers took as wives, they became sirens, is what it says. So what does that mean? What does it mean to become a siren? Well, it usually means to become a half-human, half-animal hybrid of some kind. And I've theorized and speculated this was likely done to these women to make them stronger, to make them more capable of birthing giants, basically. Because a human woman wouldn't be able to cut it alone. We're too weak and fleshy and soft. And a giant grows pretty fast in the womb and would just burst out of them alien style, you know, and often killed the women. So I think to stop this from happening, they had to hybridize the women. And it was kind of a gift as well, because they made them superhuman. They made them super strong and fearsome and powerful, gave them serpent features. So often a chidna, for example, it has two snake legs and a, and a woman's body on top. You know, so she was hybridized and it says she Ursula. used to be, yeah, she used to be a human. That's how it works. That's what sirens are. They, they're ex women, they're X men, they're the mutants now. They've been changed. And other versions of sirens are mermaids. That's a classic siren or the, um, the harpies, the half flying women, bird women, you know, they're, they're sirens as it comes under the same umbrella. And Echidna was just a very specific siren. It was kind of prized by the gods. She was given a golden room buried somewhere where she gets to where she could live out comfortably by the gods they they loved this thing they, they and it, i don't know why because she was a monster maker she created beasts she's equated with creating 12 of the most infamous beasts of greek mythology including cerberus um the hydra the many snake and the many headed snakes you know um, um the chimera as well and the gorgons specifically now the gorgons are very interesting because that's Medusa by popular standards, but obviously they had sisters as well. And God knows how many actual Gorgons really existed. I think you get these stories talking about sea gods, serpent gods mixing with serpent women creating monsters. But we don't actually know how, how many of was actually happening and how many gods were doing these. But you get these general mythos created, you know, I talk about specific ones. But Gorgons were interesting looking creatures on the early artwork depictions you can find from ancient Greece. They're not like what we see today. So you, you get Jason and the Argonauts films, for example, you know, the classic Medusa is a, a snake woman with snakes for hair. That is not what she looked like. That is not at all even close to the original depictions of the original Gorgons and Medusa. Medusa was actually had a human body with human legs, human arms, but she was depicted as being giant compared to everything else around her. She also had wings like an angel. And she had red-haired dreadlocks. And <laughs> she had a very white, pale skin with a huge smile. Ear-to-ear -ear grin with sharp, fanged teeth sticking out the top and the bottom. With wild, bulging, crazy eyes. That image I've just described to you is everywhere, all over the earth. We're talking every culture has their own version of that thing I just described to you. It's called the Rakshasa in India. They're called the Oni in Japan. Um, the, the, they go all through the Indic regions, Hindu regions specifically. It's just a wash with different variations of the Rakshasa by many names. You know, this big wide grinned book tooth, wild eyed looking snake hybrid human thing. This is an Ephelin creature. This is a offspring of a siren woman mixing with a serpent of some kind a serpent god these are the fallen angel watchers mixing with women you get something like the gorgon you get what i just described to you there and these early depictions pale white skin red hair everywhere and again you go to all these other continents where you see the rakshasa white skin fiery red hair 
big, wide, bulging guys and a huge grin. And even the tongue sticking out. Very common motif to include with it, which is a typical childish clown-like motif. Today, you stick the tongue out to mock people, you know. It's always been there. And like I said, people have seen these similarities in all these cultures. Some The, the Freemasons are traveling men. That's what they do, isn't it? They, they dominate the earth. They go around. They... Pick and choose things from other cultures, find more occult symbols and bring them back to their lodges and incorporate it into their odd mystery wisdom schools, you know. So while doing these travels, I, I, they clearly picked up these traits and put it together into this image, a caricature we, we have been told is called a clown. But it's, it's not a laughing matter. It's not really for the kids. They're trying to mimic something. They're trying to emulate something. They're trying to make this thing look like something. And the, the resemblances to just these ones alone, these few examples I gave here are, are uncanny. Like they're identical to modern clowns. And uh, episode 42 of my series is probably the best one to go to to get a good overview of that specific look I've just described and how it is across all continents. And um, even in North America, you even get the center of the, uh, the Aztec calendar. You have the wide grinning tongue sticking out, sun god in the middle. Um, but America, again, is just a wash with all sorts of things. You have the Hayoka tribes in America and the clown societies. Now, don't get me wrong. When it I'm about to release my next episode on this. It's coming out tomorrow. It's already scheduled and ready to go. It's about sacred clowning. And this is a very specific thing, which is quite, quite unique to America because they don't seem to have any other example of Nephilim other than specifically this type of thing this this sacred clowning and they seem to have equated to this image something irreverent backwards wholly against societal norms but they've incorporated it into their society as an example of how not to be so it's kind of a healing process to it so props to the culture for managing to turn something terrible into something good you know i'm not saying the cultures are evil that do these things their intentions are honest they're not trying to uh, do anything wrong here they're trying to show how not to behave by acting like the contrary while dressed in this specific garb but the black and white line thing i've described there is exactly what i saw in my vision these are the dmt jesters they are quite literally dressing like with odd shaped horns that dangle down you know um, with red makeup, they eat watermelon, which looks like they're eating flesh, which covers their body and mouth in red, which looks like they're literally eating things, you know, like people and blood. Um, and in a, in a way, it's like something from the ancient past has echoed into tra the traditions of the modern day. And the odd thing about the sacred clown is that you can go to all these cultures, whether it goes through Canada, through to the, the Great Plains, and then further south through Mexico, and then all the way down south to the... Uh, uh, this is Tierra del Fuego part of, of Chile and Argentina, right at the tip at the bottom of South America. They have their own version for the Selknam tribes, but they tell you, you know, we're dressing like demons. And it looks the same as what these other cultures are doing in the northern continent, where they, they say they're channeling uh, primordial gods and beings for the sake of bringing betterment to the tribe. Now, their intentions are different because it's odd because if you go to the Lakota peoples in more to the Canadian border they believe when they dress in a certain way the the shaman who's known as a heyoka is dressing like a specific god a thunder god who brings rain once again just like the one genus i was telling you about in australia and they dress like him in the hopes to communicate with him in order to plead with him please don't bring thunder and rain it will destroy us that's the purpose of dressing like that way with the black and white fractal patterns. The Hayoka or the tribe has trusted that the Hayoka will do the correct groveling to this thing by channeling it in order to appease it so it won't destroy them with bad weather. So it's out of fear they dress this way. And it's kind of like they say people who become Hayokas don't choose to be that way. Something happens to them, mainly at birth, where they can just be more in tune with the spirit realm. So they kind of have to become one for the tribe. They're, they're, they're like the direct line to the spirit realm and we need them to appease these beasts and these monsters that bring terrible things upon us. But it's funny, if you go further south to like the Hopi regions and you're know, going into like um, the, the desert area of America and these tribes around there, they want rain and they dress this way in the hopes of bringing rain instead. Give us more rain. <laughs> and they don't call it anything specific. They just call these things Pueblo clowns. But um, the, they're dressing the same way 
because they want to encourage the thing to bring rain instead because they're different circumstances. They're in a very cold climate in the north with the Heyo Kara compared to these hot, dry, arid climates further south. So they're appeasing to the same being for rain for different reasons. Don't bring rain in the north. Please bring rain in the south. But they're dressing in identical fashion. So these things, cultures technically separate from one another, have the same costume to channel a specific entity that does the same thing, controls rain and weather. It's odd that why would they have the same, unless they both encountered something that looked the same. It, it, this thing looks like this, This the way they've dressed, which is very, very reminiscent of a typical medieval Venetian jester. Very reminiscent. And it's just odd. And then again, you're way further south, thousands of miles all the way to the tip of Argentina, and this tribe, which sadly is pretty much almost ex extinct due to genocide, um, they they dress in the same way: black and white fractal patterns and lines and polka dots with slightly more weird motifs like cone heads and stuff, which you find in Europe, by the way, with the Wildman traditions. So it's odd that that even translated over from Europe to the Ter Terra del Fuego regions. But they also have the same antenna horns, which we see in these northern versions, black and white stripes. So this thing was continental. It, it spanned thousands upon thousands of miles and inspired culture, hundreds and hundreds of cultures, clearly with the way it looked, for them to copy it in the way they dress in these traditions that are passed down through oral tradition through century after century after century over millennia, you know? So something interacted with these peoples a long time ago in that specific geographic locations of the North and South Americas that looked like a black and white fractal jester monster. And the only thing I can find throughout biblical history and even history alone that even comes close is the Nephilim, which would have had serpentine patterned featured skin inherited from the seraphim parents, the fiery flying serpents. This is because you have to remember these things are dragon human hybrids. So the Nephilim did not look human because of this. And they're angelic, so they glowed. They had powers. They were weird. They were trippy looking things, you know what I mean? And they looked like clowns. And again, all these cultures, I'll give you just a brief overview there, all these features everywhere. I've just been melded into a Western version we call a clown. And just one more feature I think is worth mentioning here for the clown costume. Big red shoes. That is actually a specific thing the Pueblo clowns do wear for the Zuni and Hopi Indians. They dress like the black and white fractal jested monster. They act like clowns and they wear big floppy red shoes. So that was clearly a feature that was picked up from these cultures and put into the Western version. That's where it comes from. Someone's copied it from specifically the North American versions of the Nephilim. So yeah, it's it, everything about a clown is just stolen imagery from other cultures that represent the same creatures just by different names. Absolutely. And, and I'm sure with, with your research that you've stumbled across it, but uh, as you were talking about the, the serpents and the, uh, the Greek mythology, I immediately, when you mentioned uh, this, uh, wife the ser uh the sirene wife or, or breeder uh, of typhon mm -hmm. that, that she was specifically the the mother of, of all monsters i immediately went to in my mind to uh the babylonian uh, creation epic the enuma elish because that's that's the exact title that they give tiamat that she was the mother of all monsters mm -hmm. and then south america Quetzalcoatl, he was a feathered plume serpent, mm -hmm. and then it also uh, him in human form. They said he was pale skinned, with a beard, and came riding on a raft of serpents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you find you find all these, especially dragon iconography. Um, like I say, Quetzalcoatl, the plumed, multicolored, uh, flying serpents. You got serpent gods as well in um, Egypt. The fe the feathered serpent is a very common god there. Um, you have the dragons of China. You have the rainbow serpents of the Wangina, which come from the Australian regions. The rainbow serpents were said to be the ancient gods of the universe who created the earth by snaking their bodies through the landscape and making mountains and rivers and stuff. Um, you got the, the the dragons seem to always be equated with being powerful gods who took who played a role in creation 
Okay, and that actually matches up to the story of God and his closest angels, which are the seraphim, who sing holy, holy, holy next to his throne. I think they were there from the beginning. And I think they didn't help God create anything. I think dragons play, all angels, in fact, they don't all look like dragons, just the seraphim specifically are described as fiery flying serpents. That's what seraphim quite literally translates to. Um, I think they were just the ones that did look like um, dragons. I think they were the ones who were closest to God. I think that they are the ones God trusted the most and allowed to come down to man and watch over us. And they betrayed that trust. And that's why we get this odd mythos everywhere of dragons m mixing with the land in some way or melding or, I know, Father Sky mixing with Mother Earth or something. There's many allegorical ways of describing it. But you'll, you'll find it's it's pretty much everywhere. The dragon mythos is everywhere. And they always have offspring, which amalgamate into something akin to what I'm describing here, which are the Nephilim. You know, these, these odd giants that glowed with huge eyes, big wide grins, fiery glowing hair, which is like red or gold or multicolored shimmering, psychedelic patterned serpent-like reptilian skin covered in all sorts of colors and just shining like like crazy and just giant humanoid-esque bodies it's it's a very weird terrifying thing to imagine but um if you were, if you were to condense that down into a cartoon it would look like a clown that's kind of why we have clowns and to dress like a thing is not trivial to any of these cultures i've just described they they dress this way to channel sacred ancient gods we have just trivialized it in the west clowns are just something silly for the kids we do not understand the consequences of dressing that way and that's the point we're not supposed to realize what's going on there it's it's very dangerous and, and actually <laughs> it's terrifying how dangerous this actually is when you really start to think about what i'm saying here ignorance of the law it's not going to make you immune to this spiritual law you dress like the thing to be possessed by the thing. And we have more and more people dressing like clowns than ever today in the Western world. And that is by design. I mean, just just this last year alone, 2023 was the year of the clown in fashion. Clown core fashion was hitting runways. Legitimate models of high-end fashion industries were walking down catwalks wearing big red noses and wigs and silly harlequin inspired designs and clown inspired clothing and designs it seems silly there in the catwalk context but what you see there trickles down into the outlets eventually and we get a watered down version so they even they're even trying to make us dress like a clown as a, a legitimate fashion choice like not even like a joke like you know this is serious this is hot this is what you want to look like you look like a fool if you're not dressing like a clown that type of thing they're, they're selling it to people and people are buying it now it's there's a whole underground subculture on tiktok called clown core fashion which is quite literally just gen z dressing like clowns and they call it the clown aesthetic get the clown aesthetic by doing these simple things you know it's kind of this is this is a this is a symptom of something quite sinister you know and it's no surprise that every every so often every every 10 years is a reboot of, of the Joker. There's a new Joker, a new actor playing the role, or there's a new reboot of It that comes out, or there's a new clown killer movie or something. I don't, I don't know. They'll rehash anything they can to continuously keep it alive. In the 80s, you know, we had killer clowns from outer space. Well, in 2024, we've got the game coming out on Xbox Premium soon. You know, get it now. Like the killer clowns from outer space game. They cannot let it die. They want to keep it in the mind of the conscious people for as long as they can as a meme because every halloween it inspires more people to dress this way and halloween again is is not a simple just holiday to dress like something to scare away evil spirits as they kind of imply that's what it's about it, it, it's it's our way and it's it's when the realm between the the physical world and the spirit realm is at its thinnest this is an ancient celtic rite it's it's a invocation ritual time you know and they dress like the thing to channel the thing they dress like wild men spirits half human half animal hybrids and in the hopes of communicating with them in the ancient sense and when halloween rolls around and you get people dressing like the joker because that's the hot new thing you've, you've just opened up a lot of channels to the spirit realm to allow more nephilim creatures to get into our realm into our bodies and the aim is we're not supposed to know they don't want us to know that's what's going on that's why it's it's an occult hidden symbol.
and that's the point of being occulted, it's hidden from us, and only the initiated understand the true meaning and power behind symbols, and what, what they do exactly, you know, but that doesn't mean the ignorant masses involved in the ritual aren't vic falling victim to it. And, uh, yeah, and he had a bunch of girls dressing like, you know, Harley Quinn mm -hmm. from, from DC, you know, the DC comic, all the remakes yeah. of, the, of the movie and stuff they'd done recently. And you mentioned the wild man. I definitely want to touch on, on that but before uh, our time's up here. Sure. Um, with this wild man, you know, as American, we, we, we uh, equate that with Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And we always think of this, you know, hairy man or this big ape. But, uh, you know, you're from Britain, and you have your own version of the wild man, and he's a little different. Mm -hmm. But we see that, you know, with this this Nephilim hybrid gene. And I heard you mention on an episode that one of the Freemasons, or I'm not sure if he was a Freemason, but the one that came up with the first Harlequin, the inspiration, was mm -hmm. the wild man. And then you mentioned yeah. it too with with all that and and I've seen like the I might be mispronouncing it but in uh, Sardinia, the the Methunes or the Methanes, you know, around the New Year they would dress up in these hairy uh, goat costumes, yeah, and load down with all kinds of bells and they would put on this mask and they would dance through the town and do these ritualistic dances around fires and through the town and mm -hmm. and they said it was to uh, that they don't even remember where it come from. It was, it's just an ancient tradition that they've done since archaic times, but they believe it was them scaring off the the cold, bad weather to bring in, you know, good weather and stuff like that. So definitely yeah. fascinating there. That tends to be... So and, Kr and Krampus. <laughs> yeah, Krampus is a great example. Actually, Krampus is just another... It's a German iteration of the same thing, the same principle, the, the Wild Man of Europe. Uh, the Wild Man of Europe is a, is a very ancient tradition that can mainly be traced back to the Thracian culture, which is today Romania. Um, this is where Dionysus comes from, which was became a Greek pantheon member eventually. But Dionysus was always considered like a foreign god. You know, um, not really... Um, I don't know, like an outsider of of sorts. Uh, Dionysus is considered the um the god of theatre, the patron saint of theatre. Is his symbol was the ivy leaf, um, which was always put onto the mouths of the masks, which is a heart shape. And that's where we get the modern heart shape from, which we equate to you know uh, romance and love and passion and sex and things like this. Because he was the god of sex and debauchery and parties and all these type of things as well and plays. And, and he had a band of merry men that followed him, which were fauns and satyrs. You know, these uh, meonads, these hybrid wi women mixed with these hybrid men, these goat men that would travel with him in one giant orgiastic sex party from village to village. And he would pick up more humans as he went to the next place under his spell and they would join his giant party, you know, and then they would change into hybrid creatures by sticking around him for long enough under his influence. And they would become wild men themselves, you know, these fawn horned beast men type things that were just giving into their animal lusts all the time. So you've got this ancient Teutonic, sorry, Mediterranean type, um, Teutonic's north, Mediterranean south. <laughs> you got this uh, Mediterranean mythos kind of blending together and spreading all throughout this Celtic culture as well, you know, and it's kind of, it's always been there throughout Europe in every culture, this, this representation of a wild hairy beast creature with a big wide smile and wild eyes and just giving into lusts and, and, and it, they're actually quite colorful representations. Most everywhere you go, they're not typically always like just pale white goat hair or something. And that is also very common. Um, and it's 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 not distinctly a, Euro a European phenomenon. Eh? You'll find every country has has a wild man, has a hairy beast. The Himalayas have the Yeti, for example. You know, just pulling one out of my head. The America has Bigfoot. You know, they all have their own kind of version of this. And um, and maybe if I can get my book up. I even quickly. found China has one. They call it the urine. The urine, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to quickly get up my book, actually, and I do have a chapter specifically on this where I've listed quite a lot of them out. So maybe it's just a good idea just to go through a few uh, while I've got you here and your audience can see. I'm just trying to wait for the document to load. Um, but while I'm waiting for that to load, yeah, the Wild Man of Europe is is the source of the modern clown in European theatre. So when Rome collapsed, you have to understand there was a lot of actors out of work at that time because acting was considered quite a dirty thing to do and to be. 
Um, have I still got you there, by the way? Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry. I just muted the mic that way in case a loud bang happened or something. <laughs> no, no, sorry. It's just because it's my, my computer's going slow, so I'm hoping it didn't just come out on me. But yeah, you have to remember, a lot of these actors were out of work at this time because uh, the Catholics considered it like, like being a prostitute to be an actor. So a lot of these troops kind of started to travel Europe in groups out of Italy, and they formed their own little, um, their little band of um, satirists and performers that were put on quick little stages before moving on to the next village and doing it again just to get some money in a hat, you know. And this became, this developer became known as the Comédie de l'Arts movement. And out of the Comédie de l'Arts movement, you found they, after a thousand years, I'm talking like from the, the 500 to 1600, like a thousand years of traveling here, they developed their characters perfectly. And they were kind of known as basic, basic stock characters anybody could recognize no matter where you were from. And uh, those characters were based off of real things like soldiers, rich men, kings, queens, um, servants, or um, there's the stock zany characters, just pe things people could recognize, policemen, stuff like that, you know. And for some reason, this this addition was added in the coming out of that period of time in the 1500s, 1600s called Harlequin. Now, Harlequin is quite literally the representation of the wild man. Because it was everywhere, and they realized this is a stock character that everyone would recognize. So they included the wild man into their own traveling show, you know, and he was very colorful. He was very psychedelic and harlequin patterned in nature with the diamonds, you know, and he had white, like white skin with multicolored tufts of hair attached to him. And um, he had a horrible beast mask with an upturned nose. He carried around a club, and this is modeled after. Helikins, who was the French version of the wild man, said to have been seen by a 10th century French monk in a monastery while the, the wild man and his horde of wild beasts and demons roved through the village, you know. And the wild man giant had a club, was covered in hair, was quite literally like 15 to 20 foot tall, and had a bunch of demons running around him. Uh, that's identical to the Dionysian um, description who, of a giant godlike creature uh, with his Thursus staff, which had a pine cone on the end, and his band of merry demon hybrid humans who would go from village to village. This is the same tradition, just more demonized in the future from a Christian perspective, you know. Um, so yeah, the wild man is, is everywhere from Portugal all the way up into, even into Russia, you'll find examples of this, but it, it covers a huge swath of land. And yeah, that was incorporated into theatre of the time, of a late medieval period, early enlightenment, and it was called Harlequin. So Harlequin is a model of the Europeans' version of Nephilim. So I've got up, up here on the screen, um, I think I might just have to move it a little bit so people watching can see. Um, so I'll read this to you, but it says here, I'll, maybe I'll just read out some of the passage to you so we can give some examples of the wild men that I've uh, got. It's, it's only a few pages, but it lists it quite succinctly, so... I'll have a quick drink, one second. Okay, so, when one imagines larger-than-life humanoid sightings in the modern era, the most mainstream example is the hairy apple of every cryptozoologist's keen eye, Bigfoot. According to Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, Sasquatch, also called Bigfoot, uh, from the Salish Wildmen, is a large, hairy, human-like creature believed by some to still exist in the northwestern United States and western Canada. It is a beast that has captured the imagination of the conspiracy world for decades. However, as we will discover, man has been contending with these monsters for over 5,000 years. I could not skip discussing this particular cryptid, as it is quite important in decoding the origins of the clown in the following chapters. As you read, the name Sasquatch has its roots in the Salish word for wild man, and the importance of this point will become far clearer as we discuss the historical origins of the clown in chapter 14. So I've just explained to you the, the origins there of the wild man. So even Sasquatch is modelled after or named after wild men. It's the same word. Um, so there we go. But yeah, carrying on. If, however, we stay in the Pacific Northwest of the Americas for a little longer, uh, we can learn of a tribe of Indian wild men who were much feared by the local tribes called the Sitika. Oh, sorry, the Sietic. Oregon and Washington Indians agree that the Sietic Indians are not less than seven feet tall, and some have been seen that were fully eight feet in height. 
They have hairy bodies like a bear. They kill their game entirely by hypnotism and use a strange cream to make themselves invisible. They have great supernatural powers and the gift of ventriloquism, deceiving many ordinary Indians by throwing their voices. They imitate any bird of the Northwest, especially the blue jay, and that they have a very keen sense of smell. Oregon Indians at times have been greatly humiliated by the Seatic's vulgar sense of humour. The Seatics play practical jokes upon them and steal their Indian women. Sometimes an Indian woman comes back, though it's rare that they do. It's believed that the women come back with the blood of the monsters within them, like some form of genetic manipulation took place. Some Indians of the Northwest say that during the process of evolution, the Indian was changed from animal to man, that the Seatic did not absorb the Tamanawais or soul power, and thus he became an anomaly in the Indian process of evolution. For every act of disrespect or aggression towards them, utter devastation will be acted out against the perpetrators, typically taking 12 lives for every one they lose. It's well known among the local tribes not to retaliate against the Seatic when they steal women and food. The price is too high to pay. It's said that the Seatic always leave a tiny branch of cedar tree at places they have visited, or upon people whom they have killed or played a practical joke on. The Duwamish tribe at one time related that some of their women had been stolen and they stood up to the giants, rebuking their actions verbally. The Seatics, in a fit of rage, then killed 12 of the Duwamish tribe by ripping them in two and throwing them into the air. An elderly member of the tribe claimed she witnessed, she was a witness to the tragedy. While recounting her experience to a reporter in the Oregonian in 1924, it was written that she said, They took our young men like toys, turning them upside down and ripping them in two like a piece of calico. Never again did the Duwamish tribe speak, seek revenge when the women and babies were stolen by the Snaihiyum, or Indians of the night, and brothers to the noseless one. The truth is that these myths and legends of all, of tall and incredibly hairy ape men, capable of great evil and wonders, can be found all over the earth, and the giant nature of these beasts makes one think of the Nephilim almost instantaneously. One can't help but be reminded of the descriptions of Esau, the red, hairy, boastful and short-tempered giant who was a mighty hunter. Or Cain, the almost identical vagrant wanderer of the wilds, who was hunted like an animal by Lamech and Tubal Cain, mistaking his hairy physique for that of a wild beast. The same Cain whose offspring mated with the Watchers to create giants. Though it's only a working theory, it does appear that the Bigfoot phenomena could be partly explained as manifestations of those who possess the genetic markers of Cain, the wild man. They could also be remnants of far older Nephilim beings, such as the Eliud, spoken of in the Book of Enoch, or the monstrous human beings who changed their genetics in the last days before the Flood, spoken of in the Book of Giants and the Jubilees. With a quick online search, it's easy to compile the numerous folk tales and legends of tall, hairy beastmen roaming the mountain rages and caves, having an elusive and menacing presence for all those who encounter them. For example, the Yeti is said to wander the Himalayan mountain range in Asia, and is often described as being a large, bipedal, ape-like creature that is covered with brown, grey or white hair, having large, sharp teeth. Tibetan lore describes three main varieties of yetis, the Nyalmo, which has black fur and is the largest and fiercest, standing between 15 feet tall, the Chuti, which stands around 8 feet tall, and the Rang Simbambo, which has reddish-brown hair and is only 3 to 5 feet tall. The Chuchunya is a hominid cryptid reported to exist in Siberia. It is described by most eyewitnesses as six to seven foot tall and human-like with broad shoulders, a large protruding brow, long matted hair, and occasionally bearing unusually coloured body or fur. There are also reports that these creatures have on occasion taken to eating human flesh, a trait which is not apparent in its Siberian cousins, the Almasti. The Almas, singular, is an ape-like cryptid reported in Central Asia. 
They are said to inhabit the Asian mountain regions of the Pamir and Caucasus, as well as the Mongolian mountain range of the Altai. Sightings of the Almasti date back as early as the 15th century. This creature has been sighted walking upright just like a human. In fact, it looks more human than a Bigfoot-type creature. It is even said to craft clothes and tools. It is said to resemble a living caveman. Their bodies are covered entirely with thick brown to reddish brown hair. The facial regions remain uncovered, but patches of skin are dark. The skull structure of the Almasty possess a protruding brow ridge, slanted forehead, flat nose and large protruding jaw. Their feet are large and their fingers are long. Their appendages are completely covered with hair, except for their hands. The Almas is a Mongolian word word for wild man. The plural Almasti is derived from Russian, while other variations of the name are Almasti, Almasla, Bra, sorry, Menahua, and Ochokochi, which translates as the name for the forest deity in the West Asian regions, such as Azerbaijan and Georgia. Current accounts of the most recent sightings of the Almas located near the southern part of Mongolia, along the Altai Mountains and the Tainshan Pass near the northern border of China. The Yeren, Wild Man, is a cryptid ape man reported to inhabit remote mountainous regions of China, most famously in the Shenongjai Forestry reg- uh, District in the Hubei Province. Sightings of hairy men have remained constant since the Warring States period circa 3040 BCE, through the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 907 CE, before solidifying into modern legend of the Yaren. Generally, they are described as savage, strong and fast-moving, living in mountain caves and descending only to raid villages for food, or for people to wed or rape. Testimonies of the alleged creature typically agree the Yaren walks upright and stands over two metres tall, is covered in tawny hair all over the body, especially along the scalp, and has a face reminiscent of both an ape and a human. Other common descriptors include black red hair, distended eyes, long arms hanging all the way down to the knees, and big feet. The Yaren supposedly laughs when coming across a human. These ape men purportedly lack females entirely and need to abduct and rape women to breed. The Baomanu is a bipedal humanoid primate cryptid that inhabits the mountainous regions of northern Pakistan. Shepherds living in the mountains have reported sightings. The proposed range of the Baomanu covers the Chitral and Karakoram ranges between the Pamirs and Himalaya. This places the Baramanu between the ranges of two more famous cryptids, the Almas of the Central Asia and the Yeti of the Himalayas. The Baramanu allegedly possesses both human and ape-like characteristics and has a reputation for abducting women and attempting to mate with them. It is also reported to wear animal skins upon its back and head. The Baramanu appears in folklore of the northern regions of Pakistan and depending on where the stories come from, it tends to be either described as an ape or a wild man. Meanwhile, in Australia, the Yawi is usually described as a hairy and ape-like creature standing upright between 2.1 metres and 3.6 metres tall. The Yawi's feet are described as much larger than a human's, but alleged Yawi tracks are inconsistent in shape and toe number. And the descriptions of the Yawi foot and footprints provided by the Yawi witnesses are even more varied than those of Bigfoot. The Yawi's nose is described as flat, and wide. Some modern writers suggested that it arose through Aboriginal legends of the Yahoo. Robert Holden recounts several stories that purport this from the 19th century, including this European account from 1842. The natives of Australia believe in a monster called the Yahoo. They describe it as resembling a wild, sorry, a man with long white hair hanging down from head over the features. The arms are extraordinarily long, with great talons and the feet are turned backwards, so that the imprint of the foot appears as if the being had been travelling in the opposite direction. Altogether, they describe it as a hideous monster of an unearthly character and ape-like appearance. Roaming the border of Spain and France is the Basque, within the Basque mythology, Basiswan is a huge hairy hominid dwelling in the woods. 
They were thought to build megaliths, protect flocks of livestock, and teach skills such as agriculture and ironworking to humans. They were said to inhabit the forests of Gorbia and Irati. They walked in human fashion, with their bodies covered in hair, and a very long mane that reached their feet. In a similar vein, the Gentil, or Gentilac, with the Basque plural, are a race of giants in the Basque mythology with a similar look to the Basashwan. The Gentil are believed to have lived alongside the Basque people. They were hairy and so tall that they could walk in the sea and throw rocks from one mountain to another. This stone throwing led to several tales and explanations for ancient stone buildings and large isolated rocks. The giants were believed to have created the Neolithic monuments, such as dolmens found around the Basque country. They also were said to have invented metallurgy and saw the first grew and um, the saw and first grew wheat teaching humans to farm. However, they were unwilling to move to the valleys from the mountains, with a certain unwillingness to progress. In a bizarre turn of events, it's said that they disappeared into the earth under a dolmen in the Aratrazaran Valley of Navarra when a potentious luminous cloud appeared and said that this cloud was heralding the birth of Christ, uh, kicks me. And at the end of the gentle age, there are many structures and places around the Basque country with gentle in their name, generally referring to pagan or ancient places supposedly built by the gentle. Dolmens are gentilari or gentiletsk. The haraspil are gentle barats. Caves can be gentilzulo or gentle cobra. One can't help but feel these giants have a similar backstory to the mound builders of America, but the story of them fleeing underground in fear once discovering the Messiah has come is certainly fascinating and pertinent to the topic of biblical history. But the stories of giant hairy beasts does not end there. Europe has a rich history of dealing with the wild men, and many of the folk traditions within Europe, Eastern Europe, still celebrate the wild men in festivals every year. Dressing in the bizarre bell-covered hair suits and performing plays and dances to ward away the evil spirits of the beasts. The most infamous of these would be the cookery traditions of Bulgaria. However, closely related traditions are also found throughout the Balkans and Greece, including Romania and the Pontus. Wild man and its uh, cognates is the common term for the creature in most modern languages. It appears in German as Wilderman, in French as Homme Sauvage, and in Italian as Humo Selvatico, Forest Man. Figures similar to the European wild man occur worldwide from very early times. The earliest recorded example of the type of hair-covered character, Enkidu of the ancient Mesopotamian Epic of Gilgamesh. The medieval wild man concept also drew on lore about similar beings from the classical world such as the Roman Faun and Sylvanus, and perhaps even Heracles. Several folk traditions about the wild man correspond with ancient practices and beliefs. Notably, peasants in the Grisons tried to capture the wild man by getting him drunk and tying him up in hopes that he would give them his wisdom in exchange for freedom. This suggests an association with an ancient tradition, recorded as early as Xenophon, uh, 354 BC, and appearing in the works of Ovid, Pausanias, and Claudius Elenius, in which shepherds caught a forest being, here termed Selenius or Faunus, in the same manner and for the same purpose. Besides mythological influences, medieval wildman lore also drew on the learned writings of ancient historians. The first historian to describe such beings, Herodotus, places them in western Libya alongside the headless men with eyes in their chest and dog-faced creatures. After the appearance of the former Persian court physician, Cessius, book Indica concerning India, which reported Persian beliefs about the subcontinent, and the conquest of Alexander the Great, India became the primary home of fantastic creatures in the Western imagination, and wild men were frequently described as living there. Megathenes, Celesus, the first Nicator's ambassador to Changrupacha Muraya, wrote of two kinds of men to be found in India, whom he explicitly described as wild. First, a creature brought to court whose toes faced backwards, 
Second, a tribe of forest people who had no mouths and who sustained themselves with smells. Wild or Divi people are the characters of Slavic folk demonology. Mythical forest uh, creatures, their names go back to two root Slavic roots, a dick and div, combining the meaning of wild and amazing, strange. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but are generally considered wild creatures who dwell in the woods with magical abilities and unsavoury desires. You find many similar analogues to these creatures in Russian folklore too. The wild man is a monster that has captured the fear and imaginations of all nations for millennia. And it is this particular monster that will become very important when we break down the origins of the Harlequin character out of the medieval theatre in later chapters. For now, I think the repeated descriptors we find make very compelling comparison to that of the Nephilim we learnt about in section 1 of this book. Red hair, large stature, the need for flesh and blood. Lest we also forget the drive to procreate with human women, supernatural abilities, a bizarre sense of humour, and also pride, which is arguably the most Nephilim trait. I believe these creatures are likely to be diluted descendants of the Eliud and Nephil, especially if they are still alive and being witnessed in the modern era. Much mystery surrounds these beings, with a heavy debate as to whether or not they are truly physical or instead supernatural entities. We will soon explore in section 3 the numerous folk traditions found all around the earth, and specifically within Europe, who still perform rituals centred around the wild man to this day. So there you go, that's what I've got on the wild one in my book so far. But as you can see, it it's everywhere. It spreads across yeah. everything. It's <laughs> it's big. It's really big. Mm. That's the best way to describe it. But uh yeah, yeah cuz I was researching it cuz I'm writing a book uh working on one called the, the Epic of Esau. Yeah. And I have a a whole chapter just trying to build a baseline for the wild man before I go into Esau mm -hmm. and I, I, I found just so much stuff. It's like you could, I mean, whole books have been written just on the wild man and the wild man traditions. Uh, one I found really interesting. It's a guy from your neck of the woods. It was uh, Nick Redfern. Uh, he had a book called uh, the wild man mm. and it, it was really good. I've not read that one. No, I'll, I'll add it to my list. Uh, what's, yeah. what's his name? Nick Redfern. Yeah. Okay, right, I'll remember that and I'll add it to my list. I'm always looking for more books to read to incorporate into oh, my yeah. own research. But that's just one chapter I wrote just kind of summarizing that the wild man is everywhere. And then yeah. later on in the book, I go on to describe what I explained to you, that um, this, this traditional movement of actors incorporated a character based on the wild man into their set of actors called Harlequin. So Harlequin is a model after those beasts I just mentioned to you there. It's quite literally the first representation of a demon we get in, in plays in the West. And it's through Harlequin. And now Harlequin had a had a um a foil, you know, like a, a Laurel and Hardy thing going on with um the other servant of the rich man, because Harlequin was supposed to be the rich man's servant. And then you had the other servant, which was Pedrolino. Pedrolino was quite boring, a bit of a suck up. Harlequin was quite a rebel, didn't do what his master wanted him to do, um, and that was kind of the back and forth, you know, and that, that was that was the joke, That was that's where the humour came from. But that kind of progressed for 200 years into the 1800s, and it kind of, there was a switch in roles, it seems, and the clown, or Pedrolino, because don't forget, Pedrolino was the Italian version, the original version, but France picked up their own version and created Puero and Harlequin and Puero, rather than Harlequin and Pedrolino. And in Britain, it was Harlequin and Clown. So Clown was just a British colloquialism for clodhopper or fool. And the British Clown was like a loud, sausage-eating drunk who sung silly songs, you know. The French version of Clown was a poet, a sad poet who was always heartbroken, you know. So there's different flavours of clowns, but the British one is where we, we, we're going to put our focus and where we get what we have today. So there was an actor called Joseph Grimaldi in the 1800s who just played the role of clown, the British version, brilliantly. He was hilarious. People could just not watch this guy without bursting out in laughter. He was quite renowned for being an amazing actor at playing the role of clown. But he also was one of the first actors to wear a brand new costume, which was made to be worn by the, the runner of the theatre at the time. And this costume became the industry standard of all future clowns. 
And Joseph Grimaldi, the actor, has been equated with being the father of modern clowns, even to this day, because of his amazing performance abilities and the costume he wore, which is where we get all of our modern versions today. Pale white skin, wild red hair, big red nose, multicolored clothing. It was him. Because prior to that, all of the clowns, Pedrolino and Puero included, just dressed in a plain white rag. No patterns at all, just fully white from head to toe. All white. Harlequin was the colourful one, you know, mm. and Pedrolino was the boring one. But that, isn't, that didn't happen in Britain. In Britain, Harlequin became colourful, sure, but more sleek, less monsterish, which he originally was, less hairy and more sleek with a, a thin Zorro mask and a, a sailor's hat, you know, and tight leotard. Um, very lithe, very, very posh. More crafty and Loki like. Yeah, yeah, but he, well, he used to be more crafty. He kind of just became more of a hopeless romantic by the time oh. Clown was coming around. But his original form was crafty and witty and crude and evil and weird. That's what he was originally because he's modeled after demons, which is the wild mm -hmm. man. But over 200 years, his character got boring and he became more of just a a doting fool for the daughter of the rich man, Columbine, and he would steal the daughter and run away with her on a romantic tryst, you know? And the, the, the old man, the father of the daughter, who is the master, would run after them with his servant, Pedrolino, to stop them, you know, and get his daughter back. And that was kind of the play, you know, and that's where the humour came. But um, he kind of just became this boring, lovesick idiot. So he wasn't really acting demonic anymore, like his original became second fiddle to Clown. It used to be the other way around. Harlequin led the show as the demon. Now Clown's running the show as the demon and the costume changed at the exact same time. So at this time period, when this happened, the costume was actually created by, designed by, and given to Joseph Grimaldi to wear by somebody called Charles Dibdin. Um, are we still there? I think the camera's glitching out a bit. Yeah. Still, you can still hear me, can you? That's all that counts. Yeah, so yeah, he Charles Dibdin was the son of another man called Charles Dibdin. Which was all in theater, which is a version. So while heading up Sadler Bell, Grimaldi was working. Joseph Grimaldi also worked at the Royal Theatre as well. He did two shows a night in one place at the same time. He got back and forth. It was really intense workload. But um, he, he dressed Joseph Grimaldi in this new costume. And in, it's never explained where he got the inspiration from. Historically, you're not going to find the inspiration written down in black and white. It just doesn't exist. Mm. You do hear him say, I did it to make my mark on the industry. So people would know my era of running the plays and writing the plays for Sadler's Wells. But he never explains specifically where he got this brand new costume idea from and what it's modelled after. And if you look at it, it's nuts. It's like psychedelic frill patterns all over the place with multicoloured patterns. It was wild. It's like a dress of some kind. And you look at what the clown used to wear. It was just plain white rags, you know, boring servant rags from of like an Elizabethan age, you know. But this this was something else. So I looked into it and it turns out India is where he got the inspiration from. And you can quite clearly see that what he has got there is identical to the costumes that were worn by the Rakshasa demons on the temples in Thailand. It's like he literally just saw it, drew it, took it home, made his own version and made the clown dress that way. That must have been what happened, actually. That's probably.
exactly how it actually went down. And you can it's mm. identical. And the reason I know it's India is because his father, and by proxy, probably his son, were well acquainted with Indian iconography and India in general. Because he had a brother, or an uncle. He had an uncle, but Charles Dibdin Sr. had a brother called Thomas Dibdin, who was a part of the East Indalized uh, yeah. section of the British military who was out there colonizing India at the time, you know, the East India Company. And um, he actually died out there. And um, a song was written by Charles Dibdin in memorial to him called Tom Bowling. And that song is still sung today to close out the proms in Britain, which is a big orchestral event every year. So it's, it, this guy was, historically speaking, a big deal still, you know, and still is today. For what he's done but um his he he was going to move to india i think calcutta specifically because that was the part of india which was being colonized but his ship didn't set sail due to bad weather and he seems to have changed his mind last minute from what i've read in his memoirs and stuff and um he knew india well he had been there before his brother was working there as well and i believe he brought the information back to britain with him because he was a member of the Freemasons, at least the third degree, because you can find an ode to him in the Leicester Lodge manual pamphlets from 1922, having a, a section about him. Um, let's remember our late brother, Charles Dibdin, you know, and let's rem be reminded of the great work he did for the craft. You know? <laughs> and and he, in this soliloquy, it's got like one of his shows he wrote, which was called Harlequin Freemason. And it's about Freemasonry yeah. in the Harlequinard sense. And I've got the whole thing in my book all laid out. I've got the receipts for this and you, know, you can go find this for yourself and read it. But uh, this guy was talking about Hirima Biff and the sacrifice of maid and all these type of things and how uh, a motley child of mirth was born, which is the clown character, but while talking about demons and all sorts of things, it's really nuts, right? <laughs> and if I, from his words about Hirima Biff, I know he was at least a third degree Mason because they do rituals about Hirima Biff at the third degree, uh, which uh, you can go find out again. It's not even hidden yeah, the in this stuff, you know? The death yeah. and resurrection. You, you yeah, the death out. and resurrection, because yeah. like, he yeah. died keeping the secrets, all that sort of stuff. He, he refused to give the secrets to the men who demanded it, you know. And it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a symbol of you have to keep these secrets to the death. Otherwise, we'll just kill you anyway, basically. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, he was a member of the Freemasons. He clearly saw the demonic iconography and brought it back to Britain and then told his son or something, or his son went to India with him. I don't know what happened, but they worked together clearly. And next thing the you know, was passed. next thing you know, the British clown is dressed like a Rakshas, a demon of India, identical at makeup and everything. Okay. So there you go. Harlequin modeled after European versions of demons or Nephilim, which is the wild man clown 200 years later gets dressed like the Eastern version, the Rakshasa. The Gorgon with the wide smile, you know, the same thing, the Greek, yeah. the same creature. It's the, their flavor of Nephilim is what the clown gets dressed like. Then that gets copied and pasted and developed over the next 200 years through the Freemason run circuses. All of them Freemason run, all of them obsessed with Solomon, you know, and you realize, oh, a circus is just an analog for a Freemason lodge ritual. You have the ringmaster with the top hat. That's the grand worshipful master of a lodge the only member of a lodge who's allowed to wear a top hat. That represents the crown of King Solomon. Only the king can wear a crown. King Solomon, they love the guy. He used his ring, his magical ring, to control the demons and get them to build his temple. Freemasons are obsessed with building Solomon's court and his temple, building Solomon temple analogues. So the ringmaster, mm. the lord of the ring of a circus is Solomon, the ringmaster, the lord of the ring, King Solomon, orchestrating yeah. the clowns to put on the ritual circus. He's orchestrating the Nephilim to build the temple. It's the same analogy, just with costumes and name changes, but a, a Freemason, a circus performance in the early days was just a Freemasonic ritual on a huge, grand scale with spectacle. These are invocation rituals. It's their version of what these ancient cultures are doing. They are venerating, dressing like, and channeling the spirits. And they do it in the public. The public pay. The public take part. God knows what else happens to the public who do take part in those, uh, these early rituals. Nowadays, circuses aren't quite what they used to be. But they're all still run in America by the, by the Shriners, if you look into it. Yeah. And the Shriners all have their own clown section. 
the Shriner Clowns. What's a Middle Eastern themed mystery wisdom school got to do with Western clowns? Why are they dressing that way? It's because it's the costume that they were to communicate with their bosses, <laughs> like the demons on the other side. They're using it as a tool and publicly. Public, the public think it's a bit of fun for the kids. They don't even know, you know. Then a step above shrining, you have the Royal Order of the Jesters. 